Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to episode 48 of Humanity versus Insanity, the Crane Report. Now, this is going to be the last live program for three weeks. The next one will be uh, August Bank Holiday Monday. It's Monday the 31st, as uh, everybody uh, takes their summer break. Of course, with Parliament in recess, no doubt there's a lot of stuff that's going to be sneaked in under the radar um, over the next couple of weeks. But if that's the case, then we'll do a special recording and uh, punch it out uh, on, the, uh, on the normal day and time. Well, tonight, I was going to be continuing on the theme of the Big Pharma assassinations. And there is no question that Big Pharma is clearly ramping up its campaign to completely shut down any alternative, any natural threat to its revenue stream. But uh, something I think that's really somewhat more important has uh, come up. And on the basis that we don't have another show for uh, three weeks, I wanted to bring Chris Spivey onto the program tonight. Now, many of the viewers will know of Chris. And uh, you know, Chris has been right at the forefront in analysing a particular event in South East London. Now, now uh, for various legal reasons, uh, this is going to potentially be quite a cryptic programme. And there may be uh, occasions where Chris elects not to either answer the question or steer around a particular topic. And uh, that is due to the current status of his legal proceedings. Now, tonight I have two programmes, Humanity versus Insanity going out now, and then at nine o'clock, Fracking Nightmare. And there's a common thread to both programmes because what we are seeing in the UK is the last vestiges of what we perceive, or what many perceive to be democracy, actually under almost final attack, a fatal attack. And in this case, it's the ability to have freedom of speech. And let's not forget that David Cameron in September of last year took a special trip across to the UN to give a presentation. And during that presentation, he made the observation that non-violent domestic extremists should be treated in exactly the same way as ISIS. So if I see um, an incoming ballistic missile approaching my caravan anytime soon, then I know exactly where it's come from. Thanks, Dave. Well, Chris has been feeling the full force of the establishment as he has simply been asking questions, valid questions, questions that any investigative journalist worth their salt should have asked. But as we know, investigative journalism is basically dead and buried. Any journalist who digs too deeply is effectively paid off and uh, finds it extremely difficult to find work. The only journalists that uh, um, are employed by the mainstream media today are effectively cut and paste merchants. And what they're doing is they're cutting whatever it is that the establishment gives them and simply pasting it in to the propaganda rags. So without further ado, let me bring Mr. Spivey into the program. Good Chris, evening. how the Hello. devil are you, my friend? I'm not too bad. I'm not too bad at all. Yourself? I'm doing good. Are you on fire there? I'm on fire. No, that's the thing of it. <laughs> okay. So I'm my constant companion. <laughs> now, Chris, I think this is, it's not the first time we've spoken. The first time we spoke was, uh, it was actually yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the first time we've actually had the opportunity to have a, an in-depth discussion. Now, just to prepare uh, people for what may happen, we've had to resort to a little bit of subterfuge tonight because yesterday when we were communicating from our respective Skype accounts, the line was dropping every few minutes. It was indeed. So I think it took us about two hours to have a 20-minute conversation. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. <laughs> so today we've had to resort to a little bit of subterfuge. So you are at um, an anonymous uh, Skype address. So hopefully we can maintain a connection through the 45 minutes. Hope so. So, Chris, um, I'm guessing that the vast majority of people watching the programme uh, have come across your, your work. 
And uh, I think suffice to say that um, uh, apart from obviously the mainstream detractors, I think everyone is uh, you know, very impressed at uh, the tenacity with which you've shown and, and the depth to which you have explored this um, travesty uh, that occurred in, so in South East London. Now, I know that there's certain things you can't talk about. So if you don't want to talk about something, just tell me I quite understand. But um, you know, at what point was it on, in May of 2013 that uh, you started to realise that uh, something was not right about this particular event? And on the very day it happened, um, but just by way of um, the over-reporting of, of the, um, uh, the incident, you know? So I, I obviously didn't know anywhere near as much as I do now, but um, uh, I put uh, pen and paper up and did an article and it came out the next time. And I mean, I, I have to say that looking at some of the photographs and to avoid any potential um, uh, legal issues. I'm not going to show those photographs, but I am going to encourage people, as always, to do their own research. And I got to tell you that one of the things that absolutely stunned me as I was seeing photographs and watching film footage was the fact that the two alleged perpetrators um, in the photographs appeared to have what looked like um, photoshopped uh, paint on their hands, making it look as though they were covered in blood. Yet there wasn't a splash of any description on their clothing. In fact, their clothing was absolutely pristine. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I say, but only thing is, in I'm not really supposed to be talking about it. So, okay, all right. So, <laughs> well, let, let's get on to uh, then the um, uh, the situation that occurred when you found yourself uh, getting some attention from um, the uh, the law. Um, at, what po at what point can you actually start to discuss this? Well, listen, in, in um, May 2014, I started releasing um, my evidence on this incident. Um, I had it originally intended to release it all in one go, but there was so much of it and it was so conclusive that um, I thought it best if I release it in stages. Um, you know, sort of break it down because I didn't want to bombard people with too much information and, and, and confuse the issue. Um, so I started releasing the evidence in May 2014. In June 2014, um, my website was subject to attacks that could really have only come from uh, GCHQ because um, there was, in, in a six-day period, four million DDoS uh, attacks on the site, meaning that no one could get on there. And the only way that we could get around this was by um, uh, going on to our own server, which costs me £275 a month now. Uh, that cured the problem, but um, obviously uh, the, the powers that be were not happy that people could now read that evidence. Um, so what they did, uh, they came to arrest me. They, they supposedly had a referral on the 16th of July 2014. They arrested me in the early hours of the morning on July the 30th which is two weeks uh, after the, the alleged referral from the Great Manchester Police for harassment made by, the complaint was made by one person. Now, um, in that two weeks, the police failed to get a search warrant or uh, an arrest warrant, but they came specifically to arrest me. Um, the policeman in question for um, almost... Uh, army-like um, policemen, or well, three policemen, one policewoman, uh, were very aggressive. They turn up at 1.30 in the morning, which goes uh, quite against um, Code B of PACE, which says that raids on houses have to be made at uh, a reasonable hour. I mean, at 1.30 in the morning, even armed robbers don't get turned over at that time. And there I was, uh, being arrested for suspicion of harassment. And there can be no doubt that the arrest was illegal because um, uh, the, the police have admitted, the four policemen in question have admitted uh, in their witness statements that they came specifically to arrest me. Uh, there was a briefing held sometime between 11.30 p.m. and uh, on the 29th of July and 1 a.m. on the 30th of July, uh, where my picture was passed around and my description um, given over to these four police officers. 
who then came to arrest me, parked their two squad cars right up the road so they couldn't be seen from my front window, knocked loudly on the door. I say, no arrest warrant, no search warrant. I, if it wasn't, I just thought that, you know, I wasn't expecting to be arrested, but I just thought something had happened to my family or something, you know, um, an accident had happened somewhere. So I answered. And they said they want to come in and, and search my place and take my computers. I said, you got a warrant? He said, no. I said, well, you ain't coming in then. He said, then I'll arrest you under Section 32 of PACE. So therefore, you have, have um, uh, abuse of uh, police powers there by, you know, uh, ignoring uh, any warrants and, and, and using Section 32 of PACE. But the thing about Section 32 of PACE is that it only allows for search and seizure of property if you if the offence is an indictable one, which um, uh, harassment isn't, so therefore the the, the whole uh, the whole thing was. Um, sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> the, the whole thing was, 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 was you, you know uh, illegal and should never have come to court anyway. Um, how it did come to court was because before I was released from custody um, for this suspicion of harassment. I, I put in a complaint, um, being that it was an illegal arrest and, and my uh, computer had been illegally taken. And after that, I got uh, five communications from uh, Detective Chief Inspector Paul Hamid of the Essex Police, who was handling my complaint. So, you know, right away you have the Essex Police investigating the Essex Police, which is kind of no investigation at all. Um, and saying he couldn't. Uh, look into my complaint until after any the investigation had finished and any court action had been done with which you know, you know had they looked into the complaint then the investigation would have been halted immediately anyway but um i was then told by a barrister uh, a practicing barrister that that's not true what they were saying about they couldn't look into the complaint they could indeed look into the complaint and investigate it and uh, I was pointed in the uh, right direction, relevant information and whatnot, which I then wrote to the Essex Chief Constable Stephen Kavanagh, the Essex PCC, Nick Alston, uh, Detective Chief Inspector Paul Amid, and the IPCC, and my MP as well, um, uh, Dudridge, James Dudridge. And I filed it off on 15th of December 2014, and their response was to send me a postal requisition summons on the 17th of December. Now, my solicitor said to me, this comes from the top because it's unheard of, because I wasn't actually meant to answer bail until the 20th of January. Now, the fact that they sent me a postal requisition when uh, they shouldn't have, again, it, it is an infringement of the law because postal requisitions to be eligible for one. You have to be informed when you leave the police station after you've been arrested for the offence. Uh, that, that you, you know you, um, you might receive a postal requisition. But this is this is six months after the arrest. This, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, de December this was December seventeenth. So yeah, five five months. So five months after the arrest. Five months after, and um, you cannot um, send someone a postal requisition if they have bail conditions, which I had. Uh, so therefore, I have never been. Um, charged with these offences, officially charged with these offences that are, are being found guilty of. So there you have another um, irregularity, shall we say. Still, despite the fact that it wasn't, um, it should never have been in court because the whole arrest was illegal and there can be no question uh, that it was illegal. In fact, uh, Lord Hanningfield um, uh, won compensation uh, for a similar uh, situation which was nowhere near as bad as mine, in, in so much that they came at 6.30 in the morning for him, which is class as a reasonable hour. 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning isn't, especially when you have a baby uh, and, and, and uh, a 19-year-old teenager in a property like I did. So, it, when we went to court, after the, it, it was obvious straight away when we went to court in January, first time, uh, that it, I was going to be railroaded, shall we say because uh, I got there to find that I wasn't facing a magistrate, I was facing a judge. And I said at the time, I said, you watch, I will have this judge all the way through. Now, bear in mind, this is only a summary offence that I've been charged with. And um, four days prior to that, I've been bedridden. 
Okay, I was really ill, and it, it was so obvious that I was ill that uh, the GP solicitor said, you know, that she would. I, I arrived at nine thirty in the morning. She said that she would speak to the judge and get me on first. Well, I, I was kept waiting. I was the very last case, and it was nearly five o'clock the time I got out of uh, the court that day. So it was plain to see the bias that uh, I, I was up against from the start. And your legal team were there with you the whole time. No, I, at that stage I didn't have a solicitor. Because this barrister, the same barrister who, who put, you know, pointed out that uh, I was being lied to and they could investigate my complaint, um, he had told me that the word had gone down that no one was to represent me. And hence, you know, people were, uh, the, the bigger solicitor or law, or law firms should have been jumping at the chance uh, to, to sort of represent me, but um, no one would touch me with a barge pole. And it, it took over three months before we could find this list stuff. So uh, I wasn't represented at this. This was a plea hearing, uh, say in January. And, and it, you know, that, that still was set out then with his judge, and I was right about the judge. I did everything all the way through. Now, this judge, whenever talking about um, what I was claiming, um, he would roll his eyes and, and cut and whatnot, you know, and, and, and this was witnessed by people. Uh, blatant bias. Um, so there, there was no attempt to establish the uh, the facts, no attempt to establish um, the, the, the basis of your counter view. It was simply a case of the official narrative was the only version of events that was going to be accepted, and that was it, period. Full stop. And I should also say that um, when they were panicked into sending me that postal requisition summons, the evidence that it was going on was still on my website and it was on my website right up until the court case. So if I was guilty of harassing anyone, then I was guilty of harassing them for the year between July 2014 when I was arrested to uh, July 2015 when the case went ahead. And if, if not, then I can't have been harassing anybody. I say, you know, it's only after this court case um, the other week that the I was finally told to take down this, this stuff that I realised on in court. So by, by the time the, the case came to court, which was uh, in, in July, um, so basically after the, uh, the plea hearing in January, there was nothing more until July. Well, no, no, that, that's not true. That, <laughs> and there was quite a few um, comings and goings. I mean, today I still haven't been um, served with what they would, the, the prosecution would be relying on uh, in court. And um, they didn't want their, their, their main case was built around four witness statements, okay? And now uh, I was up for two charges of harassment without violence against two people and two charges of sending malicious communications to the same two people, okay? Four counts in all with two people involved, but they were relying on four witness statements. Now, these witness statements were full easily provable lies and, and what, what they claimed was quite, quite outrageous. Had they been made to come to court and repeat it under oath, they would have been committing serious perjury. Hence, the prosecution fought tooth and nail to keep uh, these witnesses from appearing as, it, you know, which breached my uh, right under Article 6 of the Human Rights Act, um, uh, my, my right to face my accusers. Now, you've got to ask yourself, why was the prosecution so intent on not having their witnesses there? It should have been me, um, you know, opposing the witnesses, not, not, not the prosecution, whereas uh, we, the other case now, the, the defence was like, was like insisting that they turn up. But um, the judge took no notice of this whatsoever and uh, 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 sided with the prosecution. So I could not possibly get a fair trial. So, straight away after that case, uh, which was by now a week uh, before the main case was due to start, an application was put for the judicial review um, and, and, and for the witnesses to be made to appear so that I could get a fair trial. I said, because what they was alleging was easily provable, false, but by them not appearing, it was accepted as fact that their, their witness statements were, were correct and factual. So, I mean, you, to all intents and purposes, you were ultimately convicted on hearsay. 
on hearsay, on, on not only hearsay, uh, Ian, blatant lies, of which, um, you know, it was alleged that I um, continually contacted these people for, uh, when we could prove that nothing could be further from the truth. And what the prosecution did um, in their evidence bundle was leave the first page of conversations off so you couldn't see who uh, had instigated the conversations, you know. And uh, this, this, this came up uh, in court, and, and, and it was quite heated between me and the, uh, the prosecution counsel, Tony Abel, who incidentally usually prosecutes um, serious organised crime and, and such, sort, not summary offences. Um, so I couldn't possibly get a, false, uh, a fair trial because, you, you know, what the prosecution were alleging uh, was, was totally false, but we couldn't cross-examine the, the, the makers of these statements because they were not here in court to do so. And I but, say, had they, had they done so, they would have been committing perjury. Well, and when I've, you know, uh, I'm aware of similar uh, situations that have arisen, when the uh, prosecution, effectively, when the primary witnesses of the prosecution have refused to appear, particularly when, obviously, the uh, defendant has asked them to appear, then, basically, the cases have generally been thrown out. It should have been, like, like I say, Ian, it, it should never have been in court in the first place because I was illegally arrested and my computers are re illegally seized. There can be no doubt whatsoever about that. No doubt whatsoever. Um, so it shouldn't have even gone ahead anyway. But having put the appeal in for the witnesses to appear, um, and, and, and I, I sent you the, the, uh, the appeal or, or copies of the appeal earlier on today, um, the judge should have adjourned it. Uh, until after any appeal was heard, and 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 then and then the trial should have gone ahead, and and I would have been able to get a fair trial. But the judge point blank refused to adjourn while this appeal was in. Well, let's and, uh, let's actually take a look at um, at these um, uh, submissions that you've you've put in there. Unfortunately, the quality isn't uh, as good. It's what my, my, my solicitor's put in, not me. Oh, your uh, solicitor has put in. But OK, but uh, I mean, let me just uh, bring this one up. Mr Spivey's defence is based on the lack of harassment towards the prosecution witnesses and the fact that any communications were not malicious in nature. In order to challenge the prosecution e evidence, Mr Spivey needs the opportunity to cross-examine the prosecution witnesses as to the content of the communications, the intent behind them and any distress allegedly suffered. The decision which is being challenged is of overwhelming importance due to the fact that Mr Spivey is prevented from challenging the Crown's case and therefore having a fair trial. And as you rightly say, Article 6 of the Human Rights Act, which of course David Cameron is, is desperate to repeal, and of course the Murdoch right-wing press, every time there's any reference to the Human Rights Act, it's always preceded by the hated Human Rights Act. Well, it's only hated by the establishment because uh, of exactly situations like this. So Article 6 of the Human Rights Act provides the right to a fair trial. It is submitted that the decision being challenged, namely the hearsay application, has a significant bearing on Mr Spivey's ability to have a fair trial. Thus, his Article 6 rights are in question. And, and basically, for the judge to override this, I mean, it is very evident to me because I have to say that, you know, I've had quite a bit of uh, experience with the uh, legal profession over the last uh, couple of years. And generally, with one or two exceptions, the judiciary have done the right thing. The one or two exceptions uh, were so significant that it, I, I would actually go as far as to say that in those two exceptions, the judge had clearly received a phone call that spelled out the facts of life and told them exactly what verdict they were expected to deliver. And, and this, once again, you know, smacks a, of that kind of scenario. Yeah. Um, well, also, on, on top of all that, you know, the, the fact that the case should have gone ahead, and, and then when it did go ahead, it should have been adjourned until the appeal had been heard. The, um, the, the, the prosecution were relying on evidence from the 23rd of July 2013. That would be the first article that I wrote. Um, uh, which, which is some 14, 15 months before the uh, um, alleged co the, the complaint was put in. So why did it take 14 or 15 months? If, if this, this uh, material that we're relying on as evidence happened, you know, 15 months 
before, why did it take 15 months to sort of put uh, the um, the complaint in? And then I was arrested, I say, on the 30th of July, so anything after that should not have been admissible. Um, of course, I continued writing um, about the event right up until November, um, and, and this was produced in court, although it shouldn't have been because it means I've never been arrested or questioned uh, about that information. Moreover, Ian, um, there was only one allegation put in, uh, one or one complaint put in on the 16th of July. And I was, I say, arrested on the 30th of July. The second, uh, the two charges, one of uh, harassment without violence and one of sending malicious communications, wasn't dealt with until the 3rd of August. Therefore, I was never arrested or questioned uh, about that, that complaint, you know. So, uh, a complete um, disregard for the law there as well, you know. So ba basically, they've just been looking to try and slap on whatever they whatever think they, they can get away with. Yeah. Just to sort of um, add some gravitas to the case, which is you know, flimsy at best. And, uh, and, and the reality is it's so flimsy. That's why the prosecution uh, have been fighting tooth and nail to avoid having the, uh, the witnesses appear in court because they know very well that under cross-examination, they're, they're going to be ripped apart. On top of that, um, uh, to, to convict someone of harassment, you have to um, prove a course of conduct. And, uh, of course, if, if there's only one complainant, and I, I wasn't told from, from the time of the complaint on the 16th to my arrest on the 30th, I, I never received any communication saying that what I was doing was um, uh, harassing these people and or, or pursuing a course of conduct to, to show I was harassing these people. So since, since I'd been doing it since July 2013, some 14 months before the complaint, how uh, logic dictates that I can't have known that I was pursuing a course of conduct that was uh, tantamount to harassment because no one had ever told me to stop what I was doing. You know, so therefore uh, there was no course of uh, uh, there, there was no pursuit of a course of conduct that um, tantamount were to harassment. And had the one complaint that I was arrested and questioned for uh, been the only one uh, put up in court, um, then they, they wouldn't have enough because you, you have to have at least two counts, and there wasn't two counts. But by bringing in the second complainant that was on the third of August, which I was never arrested or or questioned about that that put together the two the two counts needed to to um, take it to court in the first place okay so let's summarize on this because then i want to move on to what's happened uh, subsequently so basically you were uh, charged in um uh, oh, july oh, of 2014. Well, that's when i was arrested i wasn't charged until december okay so you're arrested you char eventually charged in december Following, following my complaint on the 15th, that the, the, you, you know, they, I was being lied to, they could have uh, investigated my complaint. I said I wasn't due to answer bail until the 20th of January. Uh, right. in, instead, because of this uh, illegal way that they summoned me to court, uh, I was in court on the 22nd of January the first time. Right, so that was the plea hearing. Yeah. And then the case was heard in uh, July, and, okay. then, yeah. and then where the judge denied... Um, the uh, the request for any of the prosecution witnesses to um, to appear. Yeah. So it was then, purely done on hearsay, and and ultimately the judge made a summary decision and effectively found you guilty. He did. Now, not only that did he find me guilty. Um, this is how blatant it was. At, at the end of a trial, when, once all the evidence has been heard, as you know, uh, the prosecution will do their summing up, and then the defence counsel, my barrister, will do his summing up and then the judge will retire to make his decision. As soon as my, um, uh, my barrister finished summing up uh, on my behalf, rather than um, retire to weigh up the evidence and whatnot, the judge launched straight into a 15 to 20 minute speech that must have been pre-prepared, um, finding me guilty without taking any time whatsoever to um, con consider his decision, you know? Hence, and then got proof that it was going to be a guilty from the start, which, um, before I even set foot
foot in court on the 30th of July, morning of the 30th of July, uh, um, I mean, with the barrister when I arrived at court, um, he said, you're going to be found guilty. <laughs> So, that, that, that's before any evidence. Yeah. Really. Well, uh, you know, he obviously had uh, read the writing on the wall, or uh, uh, you know, and knew how this was going to play out. I mean, I'm sure he was uh, smart enough to realise that it was basically a stitch up. Yeah. Um, so now, having uh, found you guilty, the judge declined to sentence you at that juncture. No, he did. He, he, he said he's considering um, a custodial service, uh, custodial sentence. Now. There's been quite a few high-profile uh, harassment cases where people have been bombarding their victims with text messages, turning up at their houses and whatnot, which I've never done any of that. Uh, I've never harassed anybody anyway. Um, and, and they've been heard in Crown Court, and all they're facing is um, you know, conditional discharge. Yeah, so why am I facing a custodial ser uh, sentence for something that's much, much less than... Something that should never have been allowed in court. Well, and why does he take two months to, from passing a, a judgment of guilty, he takes two months then to, because um, you, you're going to be sentenced in September, right? No, 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 no um, uh, August 27th. August 27th, okay, so it's a month, basically. Yeah, obviously, I, we had to get um, pre-sentence reports um, brought up, and it was a lot to do with the prosecution, um, Barrister Tony Abel, because of being one of the top barristers in the country for serious organised crime and harassment. Um, he, he, his availability uh, is limited, so that's why. Um, yeah, let me just say, though, you have 21 days to make an appeal um, against a, a conviction. And my, the, August the 27th makes it uh, past the time that I can appeal. Uh, you know, it's 27 days above the 21 days. So I've had to put an appeal in now, so now I'm going to be sentenced by a judge who knows that I'm appealing against conviction anyway. And so, you know, um, he, he's only going to take uh, that lightly, is he? Well, I just want to um, touch on this other paragraph in your appeal, because I think this is pertinent as well. Um, and this, again, has been submitted by your, uh, your barrister. The charges relate to allegations of harassment and malicious communications against... Da -da -da. There is a clear public interest in this case, and Mr. Spivey is being denied the right to a fair trial. There is an inequity of arms in this proceedings. And of course, that's a fundamental in law, is the equity of arms. In other words, that both sides have um, you know, the same opportunity to present their, uh, present their case. So there is an inequity of arms in this proceedings due to the financial limitations of legal aid funding. The CPS have instructed a barrister of 19, 1977 call, who also sits as a recorder. However, the defence are not even able to obtain a certificate for counsel as the offences charged are summary only. The district judge has reserved matters to himself and will also be trying the case at the forthcoming hearing. It is imperative that Mr Spivey is, grant funded to, is granted funding to challenge the decision of the district judge prior to the trial date in order that the attendance of witnesses can be secured. So, I mean, basically, this is um, your legal representative saying, you know, it, we know that, um, you know, this, this is a stitch up, but uh, basically the system is denying Mr Spivey the resources to be able to challenge the state, which, of course, has unlimited resources to bring the case against you. Can I also say, Ian, that um, the first 40 minutes of the trial were... Uh, dealing with this, that it should be adjourned until uh, after the judicial review had been uh, taken place. Uh, the, the judge, Woolard, he said to my barrister, uh, suppose I don't get funding. And my barrister told him, point blank, that even if I don't get funding, they will still represent me. So, you know, the judge can't even say that, well, I didn't adjourn it because, like, it, you know, Mr. Spivey was unlikely to get funding because that wouldn't have made any difference to barristers. Then they, they would have done it for free anyway. Right. Right. But, uh, so, but still, the judge carried it because he had a mandate, obviously, to find me guilty, and it wasn't in their interest to produce these witnesses, uh, even though they're prosecution witnesses, um, which is absolutely disgusting. Um, uh, you know, a judge is meant to be uh, a man of integrity. Where, where's the integrity there? Well, absolutely. And, you know, regardless of what anybody's views are 
about uh, the events that occurred in uh, South East London, regardless of their view. And I mean, we know that anybody who has spent you know, a couple of hours looking at the work that you have produced will realise that just like the London bombings of 7-7 and just like 9-11 and many, many other events, there are things here that do not stack up. So it's not a case of uh, you know, it being a, a done deal. But none, none, so yeah, the reality is that regardless of what people perceive to have occurred back then, under British law, you still have the right, as does anybody else, to exercise your freedom to question those events. But of course, this is all part of David Cameron's um, uh, strategy to shut down any dissent, to literally neutralize anyone who dares to challenge the establishment. So let's move forward now. So on August the 27th, which is a, uh, a Thursday, that's the day that you are due to be sentenced. And where's that going to take place, Chris? That's the Chelmsford Magistrates Court. Um, I don't know whether it's significant, but you can only get six um, uh, spectators into the court. Into the court. Well, that means there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people that um, will be outside. Know, so, yeah. so that's Chelmsford Magistrates Court on the uh, 27th. I'm guessing that you have to report there at about 10 o'clock. Yeah, at 9.30. 9.30 or so. So, um, yeah, well, that's, a, you know, I'll say no more. That's uh, August, uh, Thursday, August 27th at Chelmsford Magistrates Court, where Chris is due to be sentenced by Judge Woolard, um, who has effectively facilitated a, um, a miscarriage thus far. Um, but of course... Uh, on, on, on many, many counts here, not, not, not just on, on a few. I mean, my, my human rights have been breached under Article 6, 8 and 10. Oh, abso absolutely. But now, Chris, I do want to touch on to what's occurred subsequently, because <laughs> the state isn't satisfied with um, uh, slamming a harassment charge uh, against you. Um, and then, you know, sentencing you, oh, sorry, uh, uh, finding you guilty without opportunity to question the alleged um, victims or witnesses. But uh, there's been other events occurring which have um, really only served uh, to be classed or can only be classed as intimidatory. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, if you want to talk about the second arrest. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, on, after two months of having my computer... Now, uh, when, on that first arrest, they fingertip searched my daughter's bedroom, my daughter's nine years at the time, where my one-year-old grandson was uh, asleep. And uh, they, they did a fingertip search. And when I say fingertip search, I mean they went through handbags, they had all the drawers out, everything, OK? Uh, then they spent an hour and a half in the front room, which we weren't allowed to uh, witness. And they didn't bother searching my bedroom, the kitchen, the bathroom, all the walking cupboard in the hallway. Now, the reason I believe that they was doing such a, a fingertip search on my daughter's bedroom was they was looking for maybe drugs, maybe a bit of a, a blow, you know, something you might expect a 19-year-old to have. And they did this so they could get the social services involved. When they couldn't find anything, they then put in a malicious um, referral to the social services, saying that um, my grandson was asleep on a dirty cot sheet. I was smoking in the room. Well, I do... I, mentioned earlier, I smoke a lot, um, and I, but I was standing in the window and I wasn't allowed to go anywhere else, and, and, and to be quite frank, I was bloody angry, you know? So, um, they, they put in this malicious, malicious referral, which was um, easily proved to be malicious, yet the, the social services, supposedly hard-pressed social services, started an assessment on my grandson before I'd even been released from custody on the 30th of July, uh, you know, just for this, you know, smoking in, in the baby's bedroom when I was held there, and it's dirty cock sheet. Anyway, that, that, that assessment, um, the social worker turned up um, a couple of days later, and I told her to um, piddle off like, um, because it was nothing to do. Harassment should have been nothing to do with a social service. And so off she went, and to cut a long story short, the case was closed. Uh, I got an official letter saying the case was closed in August 2014. On October 6th, I was arrested without warrant and without uh, without arrest warrant or search warrant uh, by three plainclothes detectives who said they just wanted to talk to me. They then proceeded to kick down my door, kick down my back gate, and break my bedroom window. 
Um, I have them on tape, and the tapes are, are readily available on YouTube. Um, you can see how, how terrified my daughter and my grandson was uh, while I was kicking my door down. Um, the, the policeman is on tape saying he arrested me under Section 32. The paperwork says that they arrested me under Section 17 of PACE. So they can't even agree which section of PACE, of PACE they arrested me under. But, um, the, the point is, two months after um, illegally snatching my computers, they then they found these illegal images. Now, I know for a fact that there was no illegal images on there. Um, but I, I write, uh, I expose um, child abuse, you know, I'm not into looking at child abuse. So I knew that I was being stitched up. Anyway, to long story short, they, they took me down to the, the station, and they showed me a load of photos, including Led Zeppelin album cover uh, from the Houses of the Holy, uh, perfectly legal images of book shields in the bath, uh, taken from iconic photographs of the 20th century website. Um, the old work of Graham Oberton, once again, totally, totally legal. And then they came to the crux of the mountain. They, they had um, a hidden file of little boys having sex. Well, obviously, my grandson is a little boy, which made me a danger to him. Um, and they were, they were, you know, I, well, I, I, I printed the transcript of the police interview in full so that people can see because I, I went absolutely mad. And, you know, you can't stitch me up there, you won't get away with it. I, I tech guys will make you look silly, which I have. And, um, you know, it was CID uh, conducting this interview, and he said, well, how can we stitch you up? And I said to him, well, or how can we plant stuff on your computers? <laughs> I said, if you don't know how you can plant stuff on my computers, you're either in on the plot or you shouldn't be a policeman. And um, I said, that, that, that was that. So I was um, released on bail for it. It then, obviously, being the hidden file, which I wouldn't know how to hide file, and I'm fine again, um, was enough to get the social uh, services involved without um, my permission, you know? Uh, so they, they, they came round. It later transpired, the assessment they were using was the one that they started on the 30th of July before they even released from custody on a matter that shouldn't have involved them. Now, why would they, bearing in mind that the case was closed and the official notification of the case was closed on, in August, why would they save this assessment started on the 30th of July until um, two months later unless they knew that I was going to be arrested again. And where they cocked up, Ian, is that they started the assessment on the 1st of October, which was five days before my arrest on the 6th. Yeah. How, so that could only have come from the police. The police must have told them either on the 1st or before the 1st that I had been arrested again for indecent images. Now, Chris, we got, Chris, we got to, uh, unfortunately, we're coming to the end of the, uh, the show here. So yeah, can I, uh, I just, just wrap it up there because it's important. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm going to ask you to wrap it, yeah. Um, when, when their case fell to bits and I got a serious complaint in the, uh, the HCPC against these two social workers, uh, all, all, all these images were suddenly dropped, okay? They're, like, you know, they, they never existed. And tellingly, the judge refuses to hand over the forensic report done on the hard drives of my computer. Why would they do that if if these images were not badly planted on, on my computer hard drives, you know? Yeah, because it was a stitch-up, and I think we can see that. Now, now, Chris, have you ever considered uh, crowdfunding um, for finance for your defence? No, not, not at the moment. It, it, it's still a little bit in, in the air where my defence is going to go, Ian, because um, uh, what, what I get, I get a lot of advice, and it's conflicting advice, but not a lot of uh, hands-on help, if you like, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure what the... Um, uh, I actually have the appeal here for, um, against conviction, you know, which is, is being, sent, you know, being scanned and sent in tonight after I've finished here. Now, uh, Chris, uh, quickly, because we got um, an event uh, in Petty France on Wednesday where um, a group of your uh, supporters, led by Nick Collestrom, are planning to hand a deposition into the Ministry of Justice. Uh, I'll refrain from making any comment there. Um, handing it into the Ministry of Justice at uh, 102 Petty France on Wednesday at 2.30. So I think you're going to be there as well. well I'm going to be there. I think since, since uh, Dr. Colston has been kind enough to um, 
you know, taking his action. I think it's only right that uh, I should be there to support him and various members of my team who are almost as well known as me, they will be there as well. OK, so. so if anybody wants to meet up with you in person and have a chat with you, then they should <laughs> head down. down to Petty France, uh, which is, I think, just off Birdcage Walk, isn't it? Somewhere down that sort yeah. of yeah. area by St James's Park. Um, head down there on uh, Wednesday. And as you rightly said, of course, uh, the other date you have is the... Um, Twenty uh, seventh at uh, Chelmsford Magistrates Magistrate, Court, where they're going to try and send, me where they're going to try and send you uh, send you down. So let's um, get a lot of support for you there, yeah. uh, Chris. St stay on the line because there is another event that uh, is coming up this uh, Sunday. Um, I stumbled across this on. Uh, well, in fact, I was um, pointed to uh, this event uh, by a good friend of mine, Pied Pipers of the Truth Movement. This Sunday, August the sixteenth organised by somebody called the Dissenting Academy, whoever that might be. The event is at 92 Mild May Park. That's uh, North 1, 4PR, is a pub, situated opposite the southeast corner of Newington Green. And uh, what it says about this event is the meeting will take place in a room at the back, curtained off from the rest of the pub. There is no truth movement in this country. There is an untruth movement, populated by liars, frauds and con artists. This is a vast subject which could run and run for several months. Presentations about Albert Burgess and Brian Gerrish will be given, followed by questions, answers and discussions. Other movers and shakers of the untruth circuit include Raymond St. Clair, Ian Crane, David Icke, Roger Hayes, John Hurst, Bill Baloney, I quote, Tony Farrell, Thomas Sheridan and everyone else promoted by Brian Gerrish. Come along to the meeting if you wish to have your say. Well, you know, that sounds like a fun afternoon out. That's Sunday uh, the 16th, this coming Sunday, in uh, opposite uh, Newington Green. And I might just go along and find out what all these untruths are that I've been uh, pumping out for the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, I'm not amongst that lot. No, there. no way. Listen, you know, obviously you haven't made the A-list yet, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey. Yeah, uh, well, hey, listen, mate. I hope to uh, catch up with you, if not on Wednesday, then um, very definitely on the, uh, on the 27th. It would be nice to see you there uh, Ian, on Wednesday. Very nice to see you indeed. Well, thanks for joining me this evening, Chris, and uh, I wish you well. And, and thanks very much for sharing this uh, blatant abuse of the British judicial system. And uh, we're all rooting for you, mate. Thank you very much, Ian. OK, well, that's all from uh, Humanity versus Insanity. As I say, we'll be back in uh, three weeks on Bank Holiday Monday. But uh, join me in 45 minutes for Fracking Nightmare. <laughs>